Good morning and good everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Beam. I am the Chief Marketing Officer at New ODB, and I am here today with Tim Tadeo, who is a Solutions Architect with New ODB, to cover the New ODB CE 3.0 webinar. Today, we will be introducing uh, version 3.0 of our New ODB Community Edition. I'll provide some context up front. Uh, and then Tim will jump into a live demonstration of New ODB C830. Hopefully the demo gods will be with us and everything will work properly. Um, this is a live webinar. Uh, everyone is on mute for the webinar. Uh, you can submit questions in the Q&A box on the right-hand side. You should see a control panel there where you can submit questions. And, I, and Tim and I will take questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, we are also recording the webinar, and we will send that out to everybody uh, and available on replay. You can watch it again if you want to or share it with your colleagues. So with that, we're going to get started. Uh, again, today we are introducing our 3.0 version of New ODB Community Edition. We officially uh, announced this last week, um, and it is generally available on our download site. Uh, freely available. Uh, we'll provide that link again at the end of the broadcast if you're not already a Community Edition user or not familiar with where to find it. So um, by quick way of introduction, for those of you who are not familiar with New ODB or the New ODB Community Edition initially, overall what we talk about with New ODB is this emergence of a new form of database, something we call Elastic SQL. And we really view Elastic SQL as bringing together the best of two different database worlds. For decades now, organizations have run operational applications and trusted their business to traditional databases like Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, or IBM DB2. They provide strong data consistency, or more generally, the ACID properties. Um, they provide an abstraction layer through the SQL language, and they also provide strong data management capabilities in the database itself. But as companies increasingly turn towards wanting to deploy their applications on the cloud, a new form of database sprung up, and that was the NoSQL database, represented by the logo shown on the screen here, that provide very strong scale-out capabilities, uh, the ability to run across virtualized and commodity environments, um, provide better reliability, um, and not be stuck with a scale-up architecture that traditional databases uh, limit you to, typically. Um, what we believe is that Elastic SQL really brings the benefits of these two together by marrying strong data consistency and a SQL interface with that elastic scale out and ability to run across different uh, hardware environments. Um, and in fact, we see multiple different companies introducing products that essentially are solving the same general need of bringing these two worlds together. Um, not only new ODB, which has been in production now for many years, but just earlier this year, both Google with their Google Cloud, Planet, Cloud Platform Spanner product, as well as Cockroach Labs with their CockroachDB product, those were both just introduced and came out of beta earlier this year and provide an, an attempt to solve a similar class of problem that new ODB does. We won't go into tons of differences today between us and the other vendors. There are materials on our website to help you with that. Um, but for today, we're going to dig into this Elastic SQL concept a little bit more. And in essence, what we say is that we combine that scale-out simplicity and elasticity and continuous availability that cloud applications require and that you want as you are going through data center and application modernization efforts without sacrificing the transactional consistency and durability that your databases of record demand. That is what we call an Elastic SQL database. At a high level, the new ODB architecture essentially has a couple core concepts that enable this Elastic SQL, this Elastic SQL concept. The first is that it splits the query processing and storage units into separate peer-to-peer -peer nodes uh, or a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, where traditionally uh, databases were tightly coupled between query processing and storage. And if you had to handle more storage or more query processing, you had to scale up to a larger machine for the overall database. The new ODB architecture splits out what we call transaction engines, which are in-memory transaction processing nodes, from storage managers, which provide the durable storage and connection to your physical storage wherever that may be, whether that is on-prem, in the cloud, <clears throat> in virtual environments, or containers. This allows you to very easily and independently scale 
<clears throat> both the transaction processing and the storage management tier, yet still present to the application as a single logical database. The application itself does not realize that there are multiple different nodes or the separation of these processing capabilities. Again, it appears as a single logical database with the standard SQL API. This allows you to deploy across different environments, across on-prem, uh, in containers, uh, in different cloud environments. It allows you to handle continuous availability for either planned or unplanned outages, um, as if any node suffers an outage, immediately the workload is picked up by other nodes and the application itself never notices a difference. So with 3.0, we have built on this architecture and built on this capability with a number of key enhancements and Tim will walk through some of these in his demonstration. The first is that we've extended our support for hybrid cloud environments by adding more environments that we can run in and also by formalizing our partnership with Red Hat and, for, and uh, gaining additional product certification for the Red Hat OpenShift uh, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux environments. We've extended our support for distributed environments. We had already supported active-active operation uh, across two data centers uh, or across two availability zones. We have now extended this to providing active, active, active across three different availability zones. Um, we can also integrate with additional environments. Um, most recently, we had a customer uh, that is using uh, uh, a, a message queuing application and wanted to integrate with new ODB as an XA resource, so we've added that capability in. Um, and finally, we've dramatically improved our performance capabilities, um, as we do with many of our releases, by automating some of the uh, uh, transaction performance optimization uh, across those distributed environments and providing targeted performance improvements, especially for uh, write intensive uh, OLTP workloads. Digging into this in a little bit more depth, the new environments we support, we had already been certified for both AWS and Docker environments. Um, and actually we had customers already running in other environments, but in this release, we have added support for Microsoft Azure as well as Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and in fact, you can run across multiple environments. We have a customer today that is actually running new ODB across three different cloud providers um, to provide high availability and, and, and reliability, um, again, in the face of any uh, data pro uh, cloud provider outage. We've also added uh, and been certified by Red Hat for integration with Red Hat OpenShift as well as Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Red Hat JPOS um, Enterprise Application Platform. So this really rounds out our story, and Tim will touch on this again in his demonstration, of the different environments that you can deploy uh, and easily use new ODB in. As I mentioned, we've also extended support for distributed environments. I will note that um, due to some of the limitations in the, Red, in the new ODB Community Edition, the, red, the uh, active, active, active is only available for professional and enterprise editions. So if you are a community edition user and wish to test out the active, active, active across three availability zones capability, uh, you would need to contact somebody from new ODB and look to upgrade to either our professional or enterprise edition. And then finally, on the performance side, um, there's been a number of important enhancements there. I'm not going to get into all the details, but uh, as I mentioned, one is to automate, wor automate workload management uh, across distributed environments, doing something that we call chairman migration um, as workloads move from one data center to another. Um, we've also made significant improvements in, in SQL query performance um, and write intensive workloads. And in fact, we had one of our customers perform um, some benchmarking on a release candidate build, and they found across a variety of workloads, their transactions per, per second tests showed anywhere from uh, 10 to 20% improvements to 100% or more, uh, or doubling of their transactions per second. Uh, again, especially in more write intensive, or in this case, as measured in the, in the, in the mixed workloads where they achieved over 90% of performance improvements across the board. Uh, and again, this was between uh, the 2.6 production version that's out there and a release candidate of 3.0. So with that, uh, that's a quick introduction to New ODB and New ODB CE 3.0. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to introduce and talk a little bit about what he's going to be showing today. So, Tim? Well, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you're located. So my name is Tim Tadam, I'm the Senior Solutions Architect here at New ODB. And what I'd like to bring you through this afternoon is some ways you can download uh, and use our 
community edition product. Now, one of the things we want to help you do is when I when I bring it down, what can I do do with it, right? How can I do it? Now what? That, that faces um, in any software vendor. We want to make it very easy for you. So we're going to look at some ways uh, through how you can deploy it. We'll have a platforms you can run on, and we'll take a look at that. And we're going to also take a look at the fastest way to understand some operational aspects, right? And what I mean by that is I'm sure we have a varied audience out there. If you're an architect, if you're a DBA, if you're a developer, you're obviously going to have some different ways that you want to understand new ODB, where it fits in your environment, can it support an application that you're designing. So some of the things you come up with is, well, I don't have an app, I don't have data, or maybe I do. I'm going to bring my own, and I want to take my application and test it against my data, my schema. So we're going to show you some ways that you can accomplish that in those two cases. And then also, we have a broad set of tools that um, that run. All you need is a, our JDBC driver, and you can use things like DP Visualizer, Erwin, all these types of different modeling tools. So it makes life a lot easier as you're trying to work through your, your testing with the community edition and be able to, to move pretty smoothly. And then we'll just talk about what's, what's some cool stuff you can do and uh, some next steps. Okay, so as Jeff talked uh, earlier, we can run on a, on a very broad set of platforms. It could be standalone running on uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It could be CentOS, Ubuntu. That, that would be your choice. You can run in different type of virtualized environments. Um, you could run on, on VMware. You can run on containers as far as virtualization goes. And then my favorite uh, these days has been the cloud environments. And also, you'll, you'll see that we have Red Hat OpenShift. Now, for those of you that may be designing or working with or considering microservices architectures, I'm sure you'd have a big interest in that, right? Because it's a way that I can orchestrate, deploy my applications that run in Docker. So we're going to look at a couple of those today. All right, so you, you download it, um, depending on what your responsibilities are, how do you get started, right? I, I want to get this done fast. I want to understand new ODB. And as I said, you want to understand some of those operation, operational aspects, the developer aspects, depending on what your role is. We have the hands-on self-evaluation guide that we've written. It's rather lengthy, but it's a, a very comprehensive, simple, easy to follow, step-by-step -step so you can get get you quick, uh, quickly up and running if you don't have an application that you have to readily test or you don't have data. So we can bring you right through that self-evaluation guide to get started very quickly. Another area that we're finding with some of our customers, they will use uh, Community Edition. They're not necessarily developers. They're not Java experts, but they want to be able to run some applications. So they've got a number of ways to do that. We use something we call the simple driver, which is accessible through the hands-on self-evaluation guide. We have that posted up on GitHub. So it's actual source code that you really don't have to be an expert Java programmer. You could actually hack that um, particular source code and use it against your own data, your own schema. Very easy to do. Uh, if you want to use something that's a little bit more simple than that, we have something that we give you these small client programs. And you can see from the code there, I'm just simply going to connect to my community edition, and I can execute some SQL statements. So again, even if you do not have your own application, very easy to customize. Okay, and then lastly, if you have your application that you want to test, but I want to bring my schema in. So what you're looking at here is our, and, and we'll see some more scripts for this that we have designed up. You know, we want to bring our application, just a word of caution. This migrator is to migrate your schema. It will not convert store procedures for you, SQL statements. So I just want to be very clear on that. But it's very useful um, if you want to migrate your schemas from MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, DB2, Postgres. It's all been tested uh, on those platforms. Okay, so one of the first areas I want to show you in the deployment methods you, you can have is OpenShift. Um, I don't have it live up and running 
right now. So this is this is obviously a screenshot, but we actually used OpenShift using Kubernetes uh, in this Red Hat environment for containers. We actually did a full-scale demo uh, how we launch containers very easily, uh, how we can scale those up by adding pods, and you'll see like the diagram in your bottom left is what you're looking at is the actual architecture that we ran. We ran it both in pure cloud and hybrid, adding and scaling uh, new ODB. Okay, so I'm gonna take control of the screen. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of the environments here. So I've got this running up on uh, the Google Cloud platform. And for those of you that are familiar with, with these cloud environments, the look and feel are, are pretty much the same. And because it's one of my favorite environments is with NuoDB, even using Community Edition, you're able to stand up an environment, you're able to use any type of tools in that particular cloud environment, be it that I, I want it to um, be able to do load balancing, all of that. So you're not restricted in the size of your database. Right, and uh, Jeff talked about that. So you can get some hardcore testing. But we run up in the Google Cloud platform. Uh, we run up in Microsoft Azure, as you can see here, and that's kind of what I'm going to be using this afternoon on 3.0. 3, uh, and it's a very nice interface, and we'll come back to the screen. Just want to demonstrate on, on how you can uh, have the ability to run there. And we also uh, can run up on EC2 AWS environment. <clears throat> so I'm doing quite a bit of testing here. Again, I like the whole concept that uh, I can use these other cloud tools in here. So let's talk about new ODB community edition and how we get started. So I've got it running on several platforms and we'll kind of take a look at that this afternoon. So one of the nice features in 3.0 now, if you really want to get up and running very, very quickly, uh, we now have an admin homepage that you can use. And in this example, I have this on a standalone environment. It's running um, Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux, or I'm sorry, uh, CentOS 7 out on a, uh, a little server that I, I have running back in, in my home. So if I wanted to get started very quickly, um, I can just simply create a database here. And what it's gonna do is go out, connect to my server, and we're going to go take a look at that and quickly build uh, a, a our hockey uh, DB scheme. It has actual tables in it and so on and so forth. So there, it's, uh, it's done here. So let's just quickly jump in and take a look to see what that looks like. I'll open up my panel here. And if we come in and, and take a look in our environment here, um, right page, there we go. So if we're going to take a look at this, what it'll do is it'll just simply build up the hockey DB domain, right, and, and get you started. So it's very easy to use. Um, in conjunction, right away, you could jump to our evaluation guide and you could get started. So in this instance here, I've created the objects that I want to do out here, this, this demo DB, and you can see that up at the top. And one reason I showed you um, kind of like this is, that, you know, it's very multi-tenancy. So I've got Community Edition running in here, um, but the point I'm trying to get across here is you, it's very easy to get stood up and run very, very, very quickly. So another environment that we're looking at is in Docker. So out on AWS, what I actually have running out here, you can see the, the Docker instances running. I'm just going to quickly run a process command here, and what you'll see is the actual new ODB containers running out in Docker here. So you've got some very good flexibility to take Community Edition, stand it up and stand alone. I can put it inside Docker and run it there. I can use OpenShift to take care of my orchestration and my management and deployment of CE. So I have, I have the ability to actually do some very robust testing here. So why don't we move on here, and I talked about cl uh, <clears throat> cloud environment, particularly. So um, one thing I do like about cloud is that I've got tools. I have uh, monitoring tools that I can use. Sometimes it's not so easy, as, especially as a developer, 
uh, to be able to go to sysadmins, DBAs, and if you want to get some metrics around how your database is performing your application, you, know, you normally don't have any tools. So I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. So what I'm running here is something called the simple driver. And that comes with Community Edition. It's in our samples directory. And again, what it allows you to do is quickly crank up an application, be able to run it. So I'm just going to start this. We're going to kill two birds with one stone, talk about okay, a little program that I run here. It'll produce some workloads. It ends, again, this is highly customizable. If I come in here and just kind of take a look at this screen, I could do this two ways. I, I can parameterize this and tell how many threads I want, how long I want it to run, so, so I can get quite a bit of workload in there and get some statistics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop back over to our Azure, uh, Azure environment. And I talked about having some tooling. So what we'll be able to see here is I, I, I ran those, those, that quick, simple driver program. You know, and, uh, not much CPU, but I can see this doing type of operations in here uh, and be able to get some metrics around this. So it's very easy to get up running in the cloud environment, you know, whether I'm using Docker, you know, Azure, what have you, the cloud environments. So it, it's a, a very good way to do it. Now, I also talked about tooling here. So if I'm going to take a look at uh, DB Visualizer, it's a tool I have uh, have built out here. So I'm actually connected up in new ODB uh, community edition here, and it's actually connected up to my uh, Azure environment. So very easy to use. I'm sure everybody has um, been around plenty of tools they can use, but it's a very nice tool if I want to execute SQL other than trying to do it from um, a prompt, which you can with, with new ODB have a SQL prompt, but it's a relational database and I just have this little inner join that I run here. So it's a very nice tool if I want to do, if I'm a developer, test my SQL, that type of thing. Now, I'm a DBA type and I'm trying to look at kind of performance metrics here and take a look uh, how my database is performing. And I've got two ways here, right? I could either run this again from this tool or from an SQL prompt. And we can take a look at, at how I'm executing here um, within the product. But the tools make it very, very easy. And again, I want to iterate, you know, whatever type of tools that you're using there, where I need to get a, a database connection and build my schemas out and tests for a developer to be with some, some type of IDE for DBA type. Um, and developer maybe could use a tool like this or I'm creating models. I use something like Irwin. So this is a very quick way to get up and running uh, in this environment. Okay, so Jeff, I'm going to turn this back to you. Um, I've covered the topics that I, I needed to, to do that, and I'm looking forward to some questions. Okay, I will, uh, there we go, oops, sorry. Uh, thank you, Tim. That was a great quick walkthrough on some of the different environments, and again, I think that tied in well with the, uh, the, the new ODB 3.0 announcement and some of the new environments. Uh, Tim was able to show you some of the places that you can run new ODB. As, as we mentioned now, uh, we do have customers running us across Azure. We've tested it with GCP, with AWS, uh, VMware, Red Hat, et cetera. So good, good mixed environments. Um, obviously, Tim wasn't necessarily doing performance tests in here, but uh, again, 3.0 brought some impro important imp uh, improvements in terms of performance, um, and uh, and then also uh, the distributed environments um, and ability to do that. As Tim mentioned, um, we do have a number of tools available for you to help you with your evaluation or usage of new ODB. Um, the first is actually the simplest, which is just a quick recorded demo. Uh, if you go to newodb.com slash full demo, uh, you'll actually see that OpenShift integration demo that Tim referenced at one point, um, and you'll see us running uh, across a mixed environment, including in OpenShift, both on-prem and, and in AWS. Um, if you want to give New ODB Community Edition a try yourself or upgrade now to the 3.0 version, you can go to newodb.com slash download. Um, and then that evaluation guide that Tim referenced um, that, that is a great step-by-step -step guide through uh, using the product and checking out some of the different capabilities, including performance testing, et cetera. 
Uh, you can get that at newodb.com slash eval dash guide. So with that, I'm going to uh, open up to see if we've got any questions that have come in yet. Um, I see lots of uh, lots of people on the line. There have been a few questions here. Um, the first one I'm going to uh, throw to you, Tim, which is uh, you showed some of these different environments. Can I run across two cloud providers at once? Can I actually have new ODB running in two different environments at once? Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. And as you talked about earlier about active, 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 um, you're able to, to run across the three platforms if you're in a cloud environment. You run across Azure, Google, uh, AWS. I've personally done it uh, quite a few times in, in tests, and it works It works very well. And it's important to note for our audience out there, um, you're able to do that with Community Edition, to be able to do that. Uh, the other point I'll make is you, not only using that cloud environment, you mentioned something early about hybrid. Uh, not every type of, of project is going to be pure cloud. It's going to require on-prem and, and a part of the cloud in there. So you can run this across an availability zone up in Azure or, or AWS, and you can run it from a server behind your uh, behind your firewall. Um, second question. Thank you, Tim. That's that's a great answer. Second question um, it re regards it is in relates to the active active environment. Um, and is that for read only across two nodes, or is that full read write active active? That's another great question from the audience. So this is where we differ in NuoDB's architecture. So it's not just simply a, a you know active active where it's read only mode, right? Because I'm doing this uh, replication underneath, and I'm uh, you know I've got to be be able to provide transactions coming in, have consistency with those transactions. Um, so that is a full active active. I can be reading and writing to both uh, availability zones. Okay. A uh, couple more questions. Uh, there was a question about performance because we talked about the performance improvement um, and do we have any benchmark numbers? I mean, I'll address this unless you have more to add here, but um, we have not published performance benchmarks per se, but we actually are. We, we actually did do some tests. Tim himself did some really interesting tests comparing some of the different Elastic SQL providers that we alluded to um, earlier on, and we are actually going to perform, uh, publishing a blog very shortly uh, on some of Tim's findings there. So I think that'll be quite interesting. Watch this space, and, and you'll see some of the performance uh, numbers that we saw. Um, I, I guess on a related question, um, how is this different than Google Cloud Spanner? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I can certainly share my thoughts, or I don't know, Tim, if you want to jump sure, in. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in on some of the you know, you did. tests we did. And Jeff brings up a great point, the benchmarks we did, and we we used Yahoo's Cloud uh, Services Benchmark. So that's easy enough for the folks out there if you want to download that and just run it out of the box. So, you know, as we compare to, to something like Cloud Spanner, right, we're a different architecture. And you have to remember one thing about uh, Google Cloud is how they are replicating uh, data from node to node underneath um, in Cloud Spanner, right? I mean, they're using brute force. They're using atomic clocks uh, to keep synchronization in point. Um, they claim to be ACID. You know, we've seen some interesting things in there uh, as far as ACID goes. Um, another interesting aspect is right now, I'm sure they'll build it up to some point, is you're able to do SQL select statements, but to do any type of manipulative SQL, it doesn't support that right now. So that has to be built into your into your application mm -hmm. and use Google Cloud's API environment. Which obviously makes it a little more challenging. I mean, you talked about some of the migration capabilities and how many, I mean, a lot of our customers have migrated applications from MySQL or Microsoft SQL. And um, obviously, uh, it would be a lot more difficult if you have to rewrite all your DML uh, into a custom API as opposed to being able to continue to use that SQL. Absolutely, because that's a key differentiator. We have an SQL, you know, a full compliant ANSI SQL layer. So for porting existing applications uh, to Cloud Spanner, that might present some challenges, right? There's, there's going to be a lot of rewriting of code. You know, another interesting aspect in, that, that I see is I think Google Spanner more competes with the NoSQL hmm. uh, environments than, than is really a true, true competitor for NuoDB. New okay. Uh, another question uh, for somebody, I guess, not familiar with the Community Edition, I can take this one. It's just, what are the limitations of Community Edition? Community Edition is freely available from the link on the site here, and there's really only two limitations. The first is 
Um, from a scale out perspective, uh, we limit you to three transaction engines and one storage manager. Um, so you're able to test the sort of scale out at the transaction tier, but you're not going to get full um, redundancy at the at the at the storage manager, and that can only be run in one data center. Um, the second limitation is one of support. We we have a full enterprise support capability for those customers who purchase our professional or enterprise editions, um, and for our community edition, we do have a forum um, that you can certainly uh, get your questions answered or, or look up information there. But you know, as cu customers look to deploy this across broader environments and get full production support, that's typically when they go to a professional or community edition. Um, another question I'll, I'll handle the hand, hand off to you, Tim. Uh, it's a fairly vague question, but it just says, can you talk about concurrency a little bit? Sure, certainly. <clears throat> so we are an, an ACID compliant uh, relational database system. So how do we do that? Well, what we use, it's not your traditional type of locking, right? Row, level, row locking, um, you know, page locking, column locking type of technology, because we are distributed, right, across a, a, a large area, right, it could be a large, um, you know, across availability zones, if you can picture that, is we use something called uh, multi-version concurrency control. Uh, that has, that theory has been around uh, for a very, very long time, it's been discussed at length, so I want to make a dis distinction here. When we use multi-version concurrency control, it does not equate to some type of eventual consistency. So it's simple. Think about MVC, without getting too much into weeds here, is readers don't block writers, writers don't block readers. And you are guaranteed, the application is guaranteed to have right the correct version of the data. Okay. Uh, two questions here about sort of modern architectures. I, the, simple, the first one's simple, and I'll address that, but I'll let you talk about the second one. The first one is simply, is new ODB available off the Docker registry? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. You can do a pull, um, and you will find the, the new ODB there, uh, community edition, that is. Uh, and the second one, more generally for you, Tim, is how does new ODB fit in a microservices architecture? We kind of alluded to that a little bit in the presentation, but I guess do you want to touch on that a little bit more? Yeah, that's that's a really good uh, question. Um, if you think about it, you know, the, 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 in, in the cloud environment today, right? That's what we call ourselves. Um, you know, we are cloud ready. It's a cloud ready relational database for a lot of reasons. But let's get back to the microservices architecture. If you think in today's modern cloud environment, cloud modernization, quite a few enterprises are moving to that model, right? And what is well, what is really what is a, a, a micro, uh, microservices architecture look like? Well, the design principle is, is very loosely coupled between services, right? Number one, it's taking advantage of containerization. Number two, so I can isolate my microservices from other micro uh, set of microservices. I'm isolating myself from from the operating system so I can stay up and running. And they're, they're meant to crash as well. Now, let's contrast that, not so much contrast that, but let's consider what the architecture is of NeuroDB. You had an illustration there that talked about our transaction engines, our storage managers. Okay, so we are a loosely coupled architecture. In fact, we've decoupled the transaction engine from the, from the storage managers, two different processes. They run up here. So what does that gain you at the end? Why, why would new ODB fit nicely there? Well, if I have a microservice, right, that I want to separate out, I can easily put a transaction engine, a storage manager. I can quickly start up a container so I can scale, right, with that microservice architecture. And it brings me to, the, to you know, the broader point here. Uh, as you alluded to, we, we can run in Docker containers. You, you can run that. So I'll take it up a level. So if you're running something, um, container management type of system, be it OpenShift, uh, something that's up in uh, Azure for container management, same thing in AWS, now I've got an environment where I've got a database that can scale with those microservice architectures. I can keep them loosely, loosely coupled, uh, decoupled. Good, all right, that's excellent. Um, Actually, one last question here, and then we'll probably wrap up, but I uh, just came in. Does all of the data have to be in all of the storage managers? 
Uh, and once again, for community edition users, this is this is not as uh, as relevant a question because community edition only supports one storage manager. But as you upgrade to the professional or enterprise edition and you have multiple storage managers, the question is: Is all the data always in all the storage managers, or can I separate out and have some data in one storage manager and some in another? Yeah, good point, Jeff. And just to, to reiterate. Uh, with Community Edition, you won't have the ability to yep. do what I discuss here. So we have something um, in the product, a 3.0 table uh, partitioning storage groups. And what that allows you to do, as our, our audience has asked, is to break that database off. Um, I wouldn't exactly call it sharding. I, I, I guess it is. But it would give me the ability to do a few things. So I can partition the data, especially if I'm running in availability zones, and I want to implement my application so I've got application locality, uh, app, uh, data locality. And by that, what I mean is on the U.S. West and U.S. East. Both uh, are the same applications, exact applications running in East and West. However, in, in East, I just want to keep uh, my, my transactional customer data for the United States East in that region. So I create a table partition storage group. And I also do that in, in, out in the U.S. West. But uh, it also gives me the ability, should the U.S. West go down, I can still have a copy of that data, complete data, uh, and use the U.S. East data from that application. Excellent. Okay. All right. Well, I think with that, um, I think we've addressed all the questions that have come in online. If there are other questions that come in, certainly feel free to reach out to us. Uh, again, this webinar has been recorded, and we will be posting the recording on our website, and we will be sending out a link to everybody who attended. Um, again, thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Tim, for the great demonstration and addressing the questions, uh, and we will see you on another upcoming webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.